part number three of the deity of Christ. And uh, as we said, we're trying to approach these from uh, various perspectives that are non-traditional, non-standard, because uh, everybody uh, has um, about the same things in all of their books and approaches uh, on proving the deity of, uh, of Christ. So we've looked at it a little bit differently, and we're in the Gospel of John, the book of John, chapter 1. We'll be uh, looking at some things there. Um, we're in uh, part number 12 of our outline. Now that's what, in actuality, we're asking. Was Jesus Christ God? Uh, there are uh, many groups and individuals uh, that think that Jesus Christ was not God. Some hold him to be, as do the Muslims, a good man, perhaps even a prophet, but not he was not divine. Uh, there are others uh, who say, the various cults we have in America here, that do not claim that Christ in his humanity was God. We claim something very unusual, uh, and it does seem odd. We believe that there are three persons in one God, and we don't, call, we don't call them gods. We only call God singular. And yet we have three persons there that we believe uh, that are, are all divine. And it's the same thing with Christ. We believe that he is God and that he is man in one person now forever. And those are unusual beliefs, unique beliefs, but at the same time, it's what the Bible teaches. And um, that's why we embrace these things. Okay. Now, one of the reasons that we believe that Jesus Christ uh, is God is because he is called divine. Uh, everything in the word points to his deity. So the first thing we looked at this morning are the various places where he is called God. And of course, the, the first place, one of the most important places is when the father calls him God. Uh, you cannot dispute the Father's words. After all, uh, uh, the Father is God. He knows what He's doing. He knows all things, and He knows His Son. And it is God the Father who gives Him this title. He is also called Lord, and we looked at various ones from the Father, the Spirit, David, the, uh, Christ Himself, and even the angels that gave Him this name. Now, uh, sometimes, very few instances, um, is it transliterated from the Hebrew into Jehovah in the English? Most of the time it is simply Lord, but it's the same Hebrew word, and it's the personal name for God indicating his self-existence. That name is given to Jesus Christ, which makes him God. Then we also noted uh, an adjective that Paul uses, and in fact it's used in other places in the Bible, where Jesus Christ is called not just God, but the great God. Now that sets him off as uh, somebody unique or part of the Godhead. Uh, no other God except the Father and the Spirit, and now we have the Son, can be called great in their uh, deity. Uh, so that particular adjective is very important as we're reading there. The great God. Well, what's that mean? It means that all other gods that people make are lesser uh, or figments of the imagination. But the great God is real and has always existed. And therefore, uh, Christ is given that particular title. He is also called Emmanuel and God with us. Uh, this would be a, a pseudonym uh, if it were not true that indeed he was God dwelling among men. Uh, and that's why then the Apostle Paul gives him actually another name, God manifested in the flesh. Now, we cannot see God except his general handiwork. But if you want specific revelation with regard to God, two places, the written word, which is inspired, or the living word, which is Jesus Christ. So that um, Christ could say, make this statement, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Uh, so he is the image of, um, of the invisible God. Okay, the next thing that we uh, have noted, that's uh, where we are here, is that Jesus Christ has actually pre-existed all things. The only being that can make that boast, as it were, is God himself. 
And yet, uh, time and again, we have uh, seen that Jesus Christ was there at the beginning. Now, uh, we have noted, first of all, that he was there before certain men. Um, John the Baptist said, uh, he is preferred before me. Why? He was before me. Uh, only God could be uh, living uh, before he was born, as it were. And that's why Jesus Christ is uh, uh, God. Before Abraham was, I am. So we have given specific in uh, instances of men that are named in the Bible that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ lived uh, or existed before their existence. Then we noted this morning that he also existed before man. Let us make man in our image, says God the Father. Well, who is he talking to? Who is the us? Uh, well, the Godhead held an eternal life conference. And the, in that conference, the Father laid out his plans. Uh, the Holy Spirit's going to do certain things. The Son is going to do certain things. The Father will do certain things. And they all agreed. Uh, we'll, have, we'll call for the question, call for the vote. And they all said, yes, let's go for it. So uh, man was made. But we have found that Jesus Christ is the creator of original creation. Uh, and therefore, he was the one who created man. He had to be in, in existence before man existed. Then we also noted that um, Christ was the one who created the angels and therefore had to be in existence uh, before him. Uh, when the, God the Son was already um, living, alive as God before the angels existed, and uh, he is the one that the Father introduced to them as God. So here we are in John chapter 1. And his essence, as it were, is contrasted to that of creation. That's how we know he existed before creation. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and was God. The same was in the beginning. This is a reference to original creation. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he had to have the substance to make these things. He had to have the wherewithal. He had to have the intelligence to make these things. He had to have the okay of the Father. And that is what uh, is uh, being told us here. Um, he, in essence, existed before creation, and as God, that's how he could bring it to pass. Turn to the book of Hebrews again. Now, these verses that we're going to read in Hebrews are a commendation of God the Father. Now, we just saw report cards. We've got... Uh, three young uh, uh, people here, and they from time to time bring their report cards. And what do we say? Well, in the first place, we want to encourage them. So we give them the word of encouragement. My, that's great. Do a good job. That's wonderful. Boy, that's satisfactory. Or look at this grade and look at this comment from the teacher and so forth. And we give them a commendation because we want to encourage them for the job that they're doing, uh, putting in the time and the effort. God the Father, in effect, did this to God the Son uh, after he created originally. Note uh, verse number 10. Thou, Lord, in the beginning, Jesus Christ is here, and the Father as well as witnessing, this is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10. The Father is, is witnessing. The question is, didst thou fall asleep? Or didn't I just announce the verse? <laughs> You've, you, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. But note the contrast. They're going to perish, but you're going to remain. Uh, the only uh, person that can say, I'm going to remain unchanged through it all, is God in his essence. Uh, and uh, of course, um, we know that because of dispensational truth, that history as we now know it are test case conditions. 
Uh, God is going to bring people into the dispensation of the fullness of times, eternity future. But he's only going to bring those people in there that have passed the test volitionally, that want to do what he wants them to do. And so that's uh, history as we know it. That's why he said it's going to pass, but you're going to remain. Uh, but in actuality, uh, there's going to be a new heaven and new earth uh, uh, lasting forever. The heavens are the works of your hands, Jesus. They'll perish, you will remain. Verse 12, as a vesture, uh, you'll fold them up and they'll be changed, but you're the same and your year shall not fail. So um, all of these things are, are tremendously important in proving the deity of Christ, but they're, they're non-standard. Let's go back to um, John chapter 17. Now again, we have uh, the Lord Jesus Christ giving a testimony. And he's going to tell us just a little bit about his pre-existence. None of us can testify to this, but Christ can in a very unique way. So he says in verse number five, And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now, those in actuality should be very, very um, sweet words to us. Now, why is that? Well, let's, let's have just a little bit of a dispensational lesson here. Uh, these words are important to us for several reasons. Look at verse number 24. And it says, Father, I will also that whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. Now it's the last part of this statement. We realize that uh, he's praying here for the 11. Uh, Judas has uh, flown the coop, as it were, getting his um, 30 pieces of silver, his pound of flesh uh, for Christ. Uh, but it's this, this last phrase. Jesus Christ said, uh, and actually, you know, I've always said my mom loved my sister best. Well, here he's saying, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Here's the poor Holy Spirit who seems to be left out, but that's not true, of course. All the members of the Godhead love one another with equal love. It's just that the Son uh, is the one destined in the Father's plan to have this preeminence, and the Spirit and the Father agree. They've got no problem with that. Uh, they want to make him this glorious person for all the uh, creation to see and relate to. So note what he says. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Before creation, the Father loved the Son. Now, why is that important to us? Book of Ephesians. And if uh, this will not touch your heart uh, with excitement, you're cold. You might even be dead and uh, you just simply don't know it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world. God had, uh, God had in his plans prophecy and mystery. God had in his uh, plans what he was going to do if there would be an angelic and human revolt and how he was going to reconcile the world and the heavens back to himself and who was going to be placed there uh, in these positions of authority, but especially who would be the objects of his love. I believe that the body of Christ is loved more in, in essence than the nation of Israel because we are attached to the deity of Christ which was loved before the foundation of the world. No, he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ 
But he's chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Who, who did the Father love before the foundation of the world? He loved the Son in a very special, intimate, and touching way. But because he chose us in Christ at that time, who else does he love with that same intensity, that same fire and that same passion? He loves us in that same way because we were chosen in Christ and, and before the foundation of the world and loved with the, that same degree of love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children according to the good pleasure of himself. Now the... Uh, 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 predestination to the adoption there means that we will be placed as his adult sons representing Christ, not in his humanity, but Christ in his deity. Okay, uh, those are shouting grounds, if you will. Uh, first Peter. There's one more thing that happened in Christ regarding his appointments before creation. The only, the, see, nothing else was created uh, uh, until God started that beginning point, that point in the eternal continuum that I'm going to make things. Now, what does that mean? Jesus Christ was not created. Jesus Christ has always lived. That means that Jesus Christ is God. But not only was he loved, especially of the Father, before the world was created, the universe, not only did he choose us to be Christ's body at that time and therefore loved us especially, but Jesus Christ was chosen to be the Redeemer Reconciler as the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world. Verse number 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, you're redeemed, from verse 18, as of a lamb without spot or without blemish, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. In the plan of the Father, the Father says, got good news and bad news. We're going to create a universe, and you're going to be the head of the universe. But if there is a fall, you're going to have to be the redeemer and reconciler of this universe. And that means you're going to experience something that you've never experienced as God. Limitations, uh, uh, being subject to temptation, um, pain, and so forth. And you know what? The Father willingly made this plan, and the Son willingly agreed to it before the foundation of the world. If there is a fall, I will be the one to bring it all back together and save it. Uh, and of course, that is uh, why the Father is going to give him a name which is above every name and be glorified in his Son. Okay, let's move on here. Back to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. And we'll be giving points now in relation to our diagram th uh, three in our study. And we'll just go around the cross and see how Christ is related to the true God. Now here is another adjective that is uh, given to Christ with reference to his deity. Not only is he the great God, but he's the true God. Uh, I'll make comments on that in just a little bit. First, let's uh, bring him up to the cross. God and Jesus are equated. Isaiah 43 and verse number 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So in essence, God himself has had no beginning. 
He has had no father and mother. Uh, he didn't come from anyone or from anywhere. He has always existed. Don't ask me to explain that with my limitations. I simply cannot do it. All I know is what the Bible says. He has always lived and has the monopoly on life and everything that is fine and good and right. Uh, so here he is, in, in essence, called uh, the, the true God, the one and only. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So, if you want eternal life, if you want the way, the truth, and the life, if you want somebody who can save your soul really, you have to go to God. Okay, but now wait one second. You say, uh, I thought Jesus Christ was the Savior. That's the point. God is the Savior in the person of His Son. Jesus and God here are equated. The, the person of the Godhead speaking in these verses is Jesus Christ. Uh, you're my witnesses, saith the Lord. This is Israel's Lord. Now, I hate to, to burst the bubble of the 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses who think they're going to be in the kingdom uh, because they say that they're Jehovah's Witnesses. But if you look in context, who is Jehovah speaking to? Who are the real witnesses of Jehovah God? Israel, uh, the, the saved of Israel are the ones to witness. And in fact, the Great Commission is Jehovah's commission to his nation uh, to spread the word that he, Jehovah, is Savior in the person of his son. Uh, so we go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and look at verse number 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we might know Him that is true and we're in Him that uh, uh, is true. Even in His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is a reference back to that as an explanation. This is the true God and eternal life. He that hath the Son, says John, has life. He that has not the Son doesn't have life. Now, why is this an important point, especially to, uh, to tribulation saints or people wanting to get saved in the tribulation? Why would John make reference to the fact that Jesus Christ is the true God and eternal life? Well, you remember, John is the book that mentions a special guy, Antichrist, I thought... <laughs> I read your lips, Miss Lori. <laughs> read my lips. And I read them. <laughs> That's right. But what does Antichrist do? He sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what? God. False God. So what John is saying, okay, now look here, you, you're going to have you a false God that is going to claim that he is divine and that he is the Messiah and he's the son of God and he's going to want you to believe in him. But note, this is the true God who the son of God that that is sent. He's the one in actuality that you're supposed to believe in. And that's a, that is a strong um, uh, argument for the deity of Jesus Christ, because Antichrist pretends to be God. And John said, wait, at Jesus Christ, the one who's already died on the cross, he is the savior and he is the one you believe in for, for your salvation. So what I'm saying is that the Bible equates God and Jesus to be one and the same. Uh, uh, this uh, God speaking Jehovah in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ who fulfilled it in the so-called New Testament. They're one and the same person, uh, one and the same being. He is the true God to believe in. As a matter of fact, we'll not go there, but uh, we could quote Paul who says he is in the form of God. Morphe means uh, the, the image, everything that comprises the essence or the image of God. Jesus Christ in his entirety is God. Let's go now to the book of Job.
Job chapter 19. I can remember when I was <laughs> oh, just a new young believer. Uh, and they asked me to do a reading. And I read from the book of Job. Okay. At least I tried until somebody straightened me out. A job is what you work at the rest of your life. Job is the guy in the Bible. Okay. Verse number 25. And it says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand at that latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, note this, he understood something. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Who was his Redeemer? God was his Redeemer. Turn to the book of Isaiah 49. We'll bring the point up here. Isaiah chapter 49. And verse number 26. I'll feed them uh, that oppress thee with their own flesh. They shall be drunken with their own blood as sweet wine. But all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, uh, says the Mighty One of Jacob. Again, this is the Lord, or God, speaking. He claims to be the Redeemer. Well, then we come to uh, verses of Scripture dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. The book of Galatians, chapter 3, and verse number 13. Who in actuality is the Redeemer? Who did the redeeming on the cross of Calvary? Was it God? Well, yes. But who was it as, the, uh, as a person? Jesus Christ. So every time you look at these scriptures and say, I'm going to see my Redeemer who is God, these are verses of scripture. They're, they're not usually used to prove the deity of Christ. But we can do that. If Job's Redeemer was God and Jesus Christ is the Redeemer, what must we conclude about Christ? He's God. Uh, and, and it becomes very clear, at least to me, that that's what the, the Holy Spirit is doing in comparing and contrasting these things. Verse number 13. It's Christ that has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Curse it is everyone that hangs on a tree. So uh, Jesus Christ is equated with God uh, as to who he is, being the true God, the one to be believed in as Savior, and what he did on the cross as the Redeemer. Okay, a couple more with the, the time that we have left here and... Uh, Perhaps we'll um, save this um, last one for either next Sunday night or next uh, Sunday morning, our, our final material here. Um, turn with me to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. Zechariah, chapter 12. Now, Zechariah is one of those easy minor prophets because you just go to the book of Matthew and Head, head the other direction, head, head west. <laughs> you hit Malachi and Zechariah. Chapter 12. Now here's an unusual verse of Scripture. Because God, in His original essence, is made up of what? Spirit. And... If you have spirit, um, what can't you do to a spirit? You can't pierce it as such. Uh, it, has, it has 
no substance, uh, corporeality, uh, material that you can punch through, as it were. But note, despite that, God says he's going to be pierced. Chapter 12, verse number 5. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall uh, be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. All right? Now verse number 10. And I, the God of Israel, will pour upon the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace. And they, note the middle part of the verse. Now this is God in his spirit speaking. And they shall look upon me, this God, whom they have what? Pierced. What, now what kind of a statement is that? That God is going to be pierced. Uh, that God is going to be run through, as it were. Uh, that, uh, that somehow he is going to be penetrated and violated. God cannot be. Uh, so you think to yourself, okay, uh, how can I believe this? Well, now we understand that God in the Old uh, Testament is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is making a prediction when he assumes human flesh. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. John chapter 19. And start reading verse number 35. And he that saw it bear record. Now, what did he see? Back up to verse number 34. But well, one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. And John is bearing record that this happened. For these things, says verse 36, were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Now what did the scripture say? That God would be pierced. And John is equating that verse of scripture that we just read with the event that happened to Jesus Christ on the cross. If it was God to be pierced in the Old Testament and Jesus Christ was pierced, again, what uh, can we draw from that? That Jesus Christ in actuality, in all reality, was God. These things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture that says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. All right. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28. Now, Abraham uh, was one of many who pointed toward the blood. You remember the story when poor Isaac was going up there and guess he was all happy, made the three-day journey, left home. He was with dad, the two servants. We're going to have a good time. Dad says we're going to sacrifice and so forth. Gets to see a new area, and he's going up there, and they've got the wood, and they've got the, the fire, and they've got the knife, and they've got the rope. And uh, all of a sudden, the third day, as they're approaching this mountain, about to build the altar there, he scratches his head and says, uh, Dad, uh, we've got all these things, <laughs> but... Where's the lamb? Uh, well, what's going on here? We, we don't have the sacrifice. And uh, Abraham said this, God will provide himself a lamb. Uh, it's going to be God's doing. And uh, he did. And especially do we have this as the antitype fulfilled in Jesus Christ. First uh, words of John the Baptist when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, behold the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. 
And of course, one of the ways that the lamb removes sin, remits sin, forgives sin, covers it over, atones for sin, is by shedding what? Blood. But what's the problem with God shedding blood? He doesn't have any blood. And yet, we're going to see a verse of scripture that says that God purchased our salvation with his own blood. Note verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, God, has purchased with his own blood. Who died on the cross of Calvary shedding blood? God did. But again, just like with all of these other uh, things, you have a reference to God on the one side, but then you come over here and find out that it's referring to Jesus Christ and that it is Christ's blood uh, that is uh, made an atonement for sin. And therefore that blood is in actuality God's blood, which gives us, as do all of these things, um, the absolute proof and evidence we need. Christ must be God. He is called the true God. He's called the Redeemer, even though God is the Redeemer. Uh, he said that God said to be pierced, yet he was pierced. God said to have shed his blood, and yet it's Jesus Christ that shed his blood. Turn to the book of Matthew chapter 26. You cannot get more abundant proof than the words of Christ himself. Matthew chapter 26. We'll look at these uh, verses, make some comments, and then uh, save the remainder for uh, a final hour. Matthew 26 and verse number 28. Why did Jesus Christ come? One of his objectives was to die on the cross, more or less foremost. And he says, this is my blood, verse 28, of the new covenant which is shed for the remission of sins. So even though it says that God is going to shed his blood, we now know what that means. He's going to do it in the person of his son, but that makes his son God. A couple other verses here. Uh, Revelation chapter 1. Verse 5. Whose blood was it? God's blood. Whose blood was it? Christ's blood. Put the two together. God and Jesus are equated here. This shows his deity beyond doubt. And verse number 5, Revelation 1. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth, unto him, Christ, that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. His purchased our salvation, says uh, Luke in Acts, God did with his blood. Who was the God who did that? Jesus Christ, making him divine. Hebrews chapter 9, Romans chapter 3, and we're done. Follow with me. We've got them listed. They are important verses. Hebrews chapter 9. And the verse is 12. Where it says. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. And again, a reference to the blood that he possessed. But by his own blood, he entered in once unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Um, again, a reference to uh, him being the Redeemer um, at this point. Now, Re uh, Romans chapter 3. And this especially hits us because this is part of the Pauline message. 
What is that? That God's blood was shed on the cross in the person of his son. Who was the one who gave the quote in Acts 20:28? 20, Paul. Now why is that important? Because in the book of Romans, he sets forth the work of the cross as no other, no other person. Verse 24, chapter 3 being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Now that word means a fully satisfying sacrifice. No other sacrifice would be acceptable to God. No other sacrifice would please God. God would reject it. But through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. Paul says it's God's blood, then he turns right around and says it's the blood of Jesus Christ. Now what does that mean as we're concluding this hour with these four points that, that we have tried to drive home uh, to our hearts? One is that it means if he's the true God, Jesus Christ in fact is in reality God. If God is the Redeemer, the Redeemer in actuality was Jesus Christ. That makes Him God. God is to be pierced, but the one that was pierced in fulfillment to that scripture was Jesus Christ. That makes Him God. And then lastly, God purchased us with His own blood. But uh, as the scriptures abundantly say, it was the blood of Jesus Christ that was made the ransom, the payment in full, the pleasing sacrifice for our sins.